Hi QCon, this is Phil Estes. I'm a principal engineer at AWS. Um, my job is to hopefully help you understand and demystify the state of APIs in the container ecosystem. Um, now this is maybe a little more difficult uh, task than, than usual because there's not one clear um, overarching component when we talk about containers. There's runtimes, there's Kubernetes, there's OCI and Run C. And so hopefully today uh, we'll look at these different layers and hopefully make it practical as well that you can see where APIs exist, how vendors and integrators are plugging into various aspects of how containers work uh, in runtimes and Kubernetes. Um, so let's get started. Now it's pretty much impossible to have a modern discussion about containers without talking about Docker. Docker came on the scene 2013, uh, definitely huge uh, increased interest and in use in 2014, um, mainly around developers. Developers loved the, the concept and the uh, abstraction that Docker had put around this various set of Linux kernel capabilities um, and fell in love really with this command line simplicity of Docker build, Docker push, Docker run. Um, and of course, uh, again, command lines can be uh, scripted and, and automated, but it, it's important to know that this command line has always been a lightweight client. Uh, the Docker engine itself is listening on a socket and defines, uh, clearly defines an HTTP-based REST API. And every command uh, that you run in the Docker client is calling one or more of these REST APIs to actually do the work, to start your container to pull or push an image to a registry. Uh, usually this is local, so again, uh, to many early users of Docker, you just assumed that your Docker run was instantly creating a process on your Linux uh, machine or, or cloud instance, uh, but it was really calling over this remote API. Again, on a Linux system would be local, but could be remote over TCP or um, a much better way was added um, more recently to tunnel that over SSH if you really need to be remote uh, from the Docker engine. Uh, but again, the important fact here is that Docker has always uh, been built around an API. That API has matured over the years. Um, but it's really, uh, APIs are where we enable integration and automation. So it's great to have a command line, developers love it. But as you uh, mature, uh, your tooling and your security stack and, and your monitoring. Uh, the API has been the place where uh, there have been uh, other language clients created, Python API for, for Docker containers uh, and so on. And so really uh, much of the enablement around vendor technology and runtime security tools, all these things have been enabled by that initial API that Docker created for the Docker engine. Now, what will be good for us to understand and will actually help us through much of the rest of this talk is to understand the key concepts that were behind that API. We obviously don't have time to dig fully into all the API definitions and object types. Um, all that is available on Docker's documentation site. You can definitely go dig in there. But there are three really key concepts that I want us to start to understand and we'll see how they affect even higher layer uses via other abstractions like Kubernetes today. The first one is what I'm gonna call the heart of a container, and that's the JSON representation of its configuration. Um, if you ever use the Docker inspect command, you've seen Docker's view of that. Um, effectively, you have things like the command to run, maybe some C group resource limits or settings, uh, various things about the isolation level. Uh, do you want its own PID namespace? Do you want the PID namespace of the host? Are you going to attach volumes, environment variables? All of this is wrapped up in this configuration object. Around that is an image bundle. And this has image metadata, the layers, the actual file system. So many of you know that if you uh, use a build tool or use something like Docker build, it assembles layers of content um, that are usually used with a copy on write file system uh, at runtime. 
to assemble these layers into what you think of as the root file system of your image. And so this is what's built and pushed and pulled from registries. This image bundle has references to this configuration object and all the layers and possibly some labels or annotations. Um, and the third concept um, is not so much an object or, or another representation, but the actual registry protocol itself. And this is, again, separate from the Docker API. There's an HTTP-based API to talk to a image registry, to query or inspect or push content to a remote endpoint. Uh, for many, again, in the early days, this equated to Docker Hub, but there are many, many implementations of the distribution protocol today uh, and many hosted registries by effectively every cloud provider out there. So some of you probably already knew where I was going with that. Um, the Open Container Initiative uh, was created in 2015 to make sure that this whole space of containers and runtimes and registries uh, didn't fragment into uh, a bunch of different ideas about what these things meant and to standardize effectively around these concepts we just discussed that were core to the Docker API and the Docker implementation. So that configuration we talked about became the runtime spec in the OCI. That image bundle became uh, the core of what is now the image spec. And that registry API, again, more recently, uh, wasn't part of the initial chart of the OCI, has now been formalized into the distribution spec. And so uh, you'll see that even though there are many other runtimes than Docker today, Almost all of them are conformant to these three OCI specifications, and there's ways to check that and validate that. And the OCI community continues to innovate and develop around these specifications. In addition, the OCI has a runtime implementation that can parse and understand that runtime spec and turn it into a isolated process on Linux. And that implementation, many of you would know as Run C. And so Run C was created out of some of the core underlying operating system interfaces that were in the Docker engine. Uh, and they were brought out of the engine, contributed to the OCI, and became Run C today. Many of you might recognize the, the term libcontainer. Most of that libcontainer code base is what became Run C. So at this point, you might say, Okay, I understand about the OCI specs and, and the standardization that's happened, but I still don't see a common API for containers. And you, you'd be correct. The OCI did not create a standardized API for container lifecycle. Uh, the Run C command line uh, may be a de facto standard. There have been uh, other implementations of the Run C command line therefore allowing someone to replace Run C at the bottom of a container stack and, and have other capabilities. Uh, but again, that's, that's not really a, a clearly defined API for containers. Uh, so, so far, all we've seen is that Docker has an API, and we now have some standards around those core concepts and principles uh, that allow there to be uh, commonality and interoperability among various runtimes. So before we try and answer this question, we need to go a bit further in our journey and talk a little bit more than just about container runtimes. So we can see that Docker provided a solid answer for handling the container lifecycle on a single node. Uh, but almost as soon as Docker became popular, the use of containers in production showed that really at scale, users needed ways to orchestrate containers. And just as fast as Docker had become popular, now there are a bunch of popular orchestration ideas, everything from Nomad to Mesos to Kubernetes and Docker, even creating Docker Swarm to offer their own ideas about orchestration. And so really at this point, we have to dive into what it means to orchestrate containers and not just talk about running containers on a single node. Now, while it might be fun to dive in and, and try and talk about the pros and cons of various ideas that were hashed around during the quote-unquote orchestration wars, um, effectively, we only have time during this talk uh, to discuss Kubernetes, the heavyweight in the room. Uh, 
the Cloud Native Computing Foundation was formed around Kubernetes as its first sort of capstone project. And we know that use of Kubernetes is extremely broad in our industry. Uh, it continues to gain um, significant amounts of investment uh, from cloud providers, from integrations of vendors of all kinds, and the CNCF landscape continues to grow dramatically year over year. And so our focus is going to be on Kubernetes, uh, just given that, and the fact that we're continuing to dive into um, what are the common APIs and, and API use around containers. And when we talk about orchestration, it really makes sense to talk about Kubernetes. Now, we don't have time in a single talk to dig into all the details of how Kubernetes is assembled, all of its components, but there's two key aspects, since we're talking about APIs, that I'd like for us to understand. One, coming from the client side, is the Kubernetes API, and we're showing one piece of the broader Kubernetes control plane known as the API server. That API server has an endpoint that listens for the Kubernetes H API, again, a REST API over HTTP. Uh, many of you, if you're a Kubernetes user, would use it via the kubectl tool. Uh, but you could also curl that endpoint or use other tools which have been written to talk to the Kubernetes API server. At the other end of the spectrum, I want to talk a little bit more about how the kubelet, this node-specific uh, daemon that's uh, listening to the API server for uh, the placement of actual containers and pods, we're going to talk about how the kubelet talks to an actual container runtime. And that happens over gRPC. Uh, any container runtime that wants to be plugged into Kubernetes implements something known as the container runtime interface. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail in the next few slides. So first, let's talk a little bit more about the Kubernetes API. This API server is really a key component of the control plane and how clients and tools interact with the Kubernetes objects. Uh, we've already mentioned it's a REST API over HTTP, and you'd probably recognize if you've been around Kubernetes or even gone to a 101 Kubernetes talk or workshop, there are a set of common objects, things like pods and services and daemon sets and, and many others. Um, these are all represented in a distributed database. Again, the API is how you handle operations, create and update and delete. Um, and the rest of the Kubernetes ecosystem is really using various watchers and reconcilers to handle the operational flow for how these deployments or pods actually end up on a node. And the power of Kubernetes is really the extensibility of this declarative state system. Um, if you're not happy with the abstractions given to you, some of these common objects I just talked about, you can create your own custom resource objects. They're going to land in that same distributed database, and you can create custom controllers to handle operations on those. Now, we're not going to go any deeper into that, but there's another talk in the API track here at QCon that will dig much deeper into that that could be of interest to you. So as we saw in that initial diagram, a Kubernetes cluster is made up of multiple nodes, and on each node is a piece of software called the kubelet. The kubelet, again, is listening for state changes in the distributed database and is looking to place pods and deployments onto the local node when instructed to do so by the orchestration layer. The kubelet doesn't run containers itself, it needs a container runtime. Initially, when Kubernetes was created, it used Docker as the runtime. And there was a piece of software called the Docker Shim, part of the kubelet, that implemented this interface between the kubelet and Docker. Uh, that implementation has been deprecated and will be removed in the upcoming release of Kubernetes later this month. So what you have left is the container runtime interface created several years ago as a common interface so that any compliant container runtime could service the kubelet. Um, if you think about it, the CRI is really the only common API for runtimes we have today. We talked about this earlier, the Docker had an API, 
Container D, the project I'm a maintainer of, we have a Go API as well as the gRPC API to our services, uh, Creo, Podman, Singularity. There are many other runtimes uh, out there across the ecosystem. But CRI is really providing a common uh, API, although truly the CRI is not really used outside of the Kubernetes ecosystem today. So instead of being a common API endpoint, that you could use anywhere in the container universe. Uh, CRI really tends to only be used in the Kubernetes ecosystem and pairs with other uh, interfaces like CNI for networking and CSI for storage. If you do implement the CRI, say you're going to create a container runtime and, and you want to plug into Kubernetes, um, it's not just enough to represent containers. There's the idea of a pod and a pod sandbox these are represented in the definition of the CRI gRPC interfaces. And you can look those up on GitHub and see exactly what interfaces uh, you have to implement to be a CRI compliant runtime. So let's briefly summarize what we've seen as we've looked at Kubernetes from an API perspective. Kubernetes has a client API that reflects this Kubernetes object model it's a well-defined API that's versioned. It uses uh, REST over HTTP. And so tools like kubectl uh, use that API. When we talk about how container runtimes are driven from the kubelet, this uses gRPC-defined interfaces known as the container runtime interface. And hearkening back to almost the beginning of our talk, when we actually talk about containers and images uh, that are used by these runtimes, these are OCI compliant. And that's important because uh, fitting into the broader container ecosystem, there's interoperability between these runtimes because of the OCI specs. And so when if you look at the pod specification in Kubernetes, some of those flags and features that you would pass to a container represent settings in the OCI runtime spec, for example. And when you define an image reference, how that's pulled from a registry uses the OCI distribution API. So that summarizes briefly uh, kind of both ends of the spectrum of the Kubernetes API that we've looked at. So coming back to our initial question, have we found that common API for containers? Uh, maybe in some ways, if we're talking in the context of Kubernetes, the CRI is that well-defined common API that abstracts away container runtime differences. Uh, but it's not, again, as we mentioned, it's not used outside of Kubernetes. And so therefore, we still have uh, other APIs and other models of interacting with uh, container life cycles when we're not in the Kubernetes ecosystem. However, the CRI API is providing uh, a valuable entry point for integrations and, and automation in the Kubernetes context. For example, tools maybe from Sysdig or Datadog or Aqua Security or others can use that CRI endpoint um, similar to how in the pre-Kubernetes world they might have used the Docker Engine API endpoint uh, to gather information about what containers are running or provide other telemetry and security information, coalesce maybe with eBPF tools or other things that those agents are running uh, on your behalf. Um, but again, maybe we're going to have to to back away from the hope that we would find a common API that covers the whole spectrum of the container universe and go back to a moniker that Docker used at the very dawn, as you might say, of the, the container era. As you well know, no talk on containers is complete without the picture of a container ship somewhere, so here you go. But that shipping metaphor has been used uh, to good effect by Docker uh, throughout the, the last several years. Um, and one of those kind of monikers that they've used throughout that, that era has been build, ship, and run. And it's a, it's a good representation of, of kind of the phases of, of development uh, in which containers are used. And so 
maybe instead of trying to find that one overarching API, we should think about for each of these steps in the life cycle of moving containers from development to production, where do APIs exist? How would you use them? Given your role, uh, where do they make sense? We're going to take that aspect uh, of APIs uh, from here on out and hopefully make it uh, practical to understand where you should be using what APIs uh, from the container ecosystem. All right, so let's dive in and look briefly at build, ship, and run as they relate to APIs or standardization that may be available in each of those categories. So first, let's look at build. Dockerfile itself, the syntax of how Docker files are put together, uh, has never been standardized uh, in a formal way, but effectively has become a de facto standard. Now we'll talk in a few minutes that Dockerfile is not the only way to produce a container image. It might be the most traditional and, and straightforward manner, but there's a lot of tooling out there assembling container images without using Docker files. And of course, the lack of sort of a formal API for build is not necessarily a, a strong requirement in this space because teams tend to adopt tools that match the requirements for that organization. So maybe there's already a traditional Jenkins cluster. Maybe they have adopted GitLab or are using GitHub Actions or other hosted providers or, or even vendor tools um, like CodeFresh. What really matters is that the output of these tools is, is a standard format. So we've already talked about OCI and the image format and the, and the registry API, which we'll talk about under ship. But it really doesn't matter what the inputs are, what those build tools are, the fact that all these tools are producing OCI compliant images that can be shipped to OCI compliant registries is the standardization that has uh, become valuable for the container ecosystem. And of course, build ties very closely to ship because as soon as I assemble an image, I want to put it in a registry. And here we have the most straightforward answer, yes. Uh, the registry and distribution protocol is an OCI standard today. We talked about that and how it came to be coming out of the original Docker registry protocol. And so pushing and pulling images and, and related artifacts is standardized and the API is stable and well understood. There are still some unique aspects to this around authentication that is not part of the standard, but at least the core uh, functionality of pushing an image reference and all its component parts uh, to a registry is part of that standard. When we talk about run, we're going to have to really talk sort of in two different aspects. Uh, when we talk about Kubernetes, uh, as we have been for a few, few last few slides, uh, the Kubernetes API is clearly defined and well adopted uh, by many tools and, and organizations. But when we step down to that runtime layer, as we've noted, only the formats are standardized there. So the OCI runtime spec and image spec. Now we've already noted that CRI is the common factor among major runtimes built around those underlying OCI standard types. Uh, so that does give us commonality in the Kubernetes space, but not necessarily at the runtime layer itself. So even though I just said that using a traditional Docker file is not the only way to generate a container image, this use of base images and Docker files uh, and the workflow around that remains a significant part of how people build images today. And this is encoded into tools like Docker Build, BuildKit, which is effectively replacing Docker Build with its own implementation, but also used by many other tools, Builda from Red Hat and many others continue to provide and enhance this workflow of Docker file, base images, adding content, etc. And the API in this model is really that Docker file syntax. Uh, BuildKit has actually been providing revisions of the Docker file, in effect its own standard, and adding new features. And so there are interesting new innovations that have been announced even in the past few weeks. Now, if you're looking for tools that combine these build workflows with Kubernetes 
deployments and development models. Um, there are definitely more than the few I'm going to list, but you can look at Scaffold or Tekton or Conoco, uh, and again, many other vendor tools that integrate ideas like GitOps and CICD with these traditional build operations of getting your container images assembled. There are a few interesting projects out there that may be worth looking at. KO, um, if you're writing in Go, maybe writing uh, microservices that you just want static Go binaries on a very, very slim base, uh, KO can do that for you, even build multi-arc images, and integrates push um, and integrates with many other tools. Uh, build packs, which has been contributed to the CNCF, coming out of uh, some of the original work in Cloud Foundry uh, brings interesting ideas about replacing those base layers without having to rebuild the whole image. As I mentioned a minute ago, BuildKit has been adding some interesting innovations and actually just have a recent blog post about a very similar idea using Dockerfile. And then Dagger.io, a, a new project from Solomon Hikes and some of his early founders from Docker, um, are looking at providing some new ideas around CI/CD, again integrating with Kubernetes and other container services, um, providing a pipeline for build CI/CD and update of images. So we mentioned that for ship, there's already a common registry distribution API and a common format, the OCI image spec, and many build tools handle the ship step already by default. They can ship images to any OCI compliant registry. All the build tools we just talked about support pushing uh, up to cloud services like ECR or uh, GCR, an on-prem registry or self-hosted registry. Now the innovations here will most likely come via artifact support. Uh, one of the hottest topics in this, in this space is image signing. And so you've probably heard of projects like Cosign and SigStore and the Notary V2 efforts. Um, there's a lot of talk about secure supply chain. And so Software Bill of Materials is another artifact type that aligns with your container image. And then there's ideas about bundling. It's not just my image, but Helm charts or other artifacts that might go along with my image. And so these topics are being collaborated on in various OCI and CNCF working groups and therefore hopefully this will lead to common APIs and formats and not a, a unique set of tools that will all operate slightly differently. And so again, SHIP has uh, maybe our clearest sense of, of common APIs, common formats, and it continues to do so even with some of the innovations around artifacts and signing. Now for the run phase, we're going to split our discussion along two axes, one as a user or consumer, and the other as a builder or a vendor. On the user side, you're really, your main choice is going to be Kubernetes or something else. And with Kubernetes, as we've talked about, you'll have options for additional abstractions or uh, not just whether you depend on a managed service from a cloud provider or roll your own, but even higher layer abstractions around PaaS's like Knative or OpenFaaS or Cloud Foundry, which also is built around Kubernetes. But no matter your choice here, the APIs will be common across these tools and there'll be a breadth of integrations that you can pick from because of the size and scale of the CNCF and Kubernetes ecosystem. Now maybe Kubernetes won't be the choice uh, based on your specific needs, and you may choose some non-Kubernetes orchestration model, maybe one of the major cloud providers, Fargate or Cloud Run, uh, or maybe uh, Cycle.io or HashCorp's Nomad. Uh, again, ideas that aren't built around Kubernetes but provide some of those same capabilities. In these cases, obviously you'll be adopting the API and the tools and the structure of that particular orchestration platform. Now as a builder or vendor, again, uh, maybe you'll have the option to stay within the Kubernetes or CNCF ecosystem, and you'll be building or extending or integrating with the Kubernetes API and its control plane. Again, giving you a common API entry point, 
and the broad adoption uh, means you'll have lots of building blocks and other integrations to work with. Now, if you need to integrate with container runtimes, uh, we've already talked about sort of the easy path within the Kubernetes context of just using the CRI. The CRI has already abstracted you away from having to know details about the particular runtime providing the CRI. But if you need to integrate at a lower point for more than one runtime, uh, we've already talked about there not being any clean option for that. Um, now, maybe there's a potential for you to integrate at the lowest layer of the stack, uh, run C or, or have using OCI hooks, but there are drawbacks there as well because maybe there'll be integration with uh, micro VMs like Kata containers or Firecracker, uh, which may prevent you from having the integration you need at that layer. Hopefully in these last few minutes you've seen some of the trade-offs and pros and cons of decisions you'll need to make either as someone building tools for this space or needing to adopt a platform or trying to understand how to navigate the container space. So here, here's a summary of a few decision points. First of all, I'd say that the Docker engine and its API are still a valid single node solution for developers. There's plenty of tools and integrations. It's been around for quite a while. Uh, we haven't even talked about Docker Compose, which is still very popular and has plenty of tools built around it. Uh, so much so that Podman from Red Hat has also implemented the Docker API and added Compose support. Alternatively, uh, Containerd, which really was created um, as an engine to be embedded uh, without really a full client, now has a client project called NerdCTL uh, that also has been adding Compose support and providing some of the similar client experiences without the full Docker engine. Of course, we've already seen that Kubernetes really provides the most adopted platform in this space, both for tools and having a common API and this allows uh, for broad standardization, uh, so tools, interoperability, uh, use in both development and production. Uh, there's a ton going on in this space, and I assume and believe that will continue. It's also worth noting that even though we've shown that there's no real common API uh, outside of the Kubernetes ecosystem for containers, uh, most likely, uh, as you know, you're going to adopt other APIs adjacent uh, even to your Kubernetes use or container tools that you might adopt. You're going to choose probably a cloud provider, an infrastructure platform. You're going to use other services around storage and networking. And again, uh, there will always be a, a small handful of APIs, uh, even if we could come into a perfect world where we defined a clear and common API for containers. So what about the future? I think it's pretty easy to say that significant innovation around runtimes and the APIs around them will stay in Kubernetes because of the breadth of adoption and the commonality provided there. So for example, SigNode, the special interest group in Kubernetes focused on the node that includes the kubelet software and its components and the OCI communities are really providing innovations that cross up through the stack to enhance capabilities. For example, there have been Kubernetes enhancement proposals still in flight for user namespaces, checkpoint restore, swap support. And so as these features are added, they drive this commonality up through being exposed in the CRI and also implemented by the teams managing the runtimes themselves. So you get to adopt new container capabilities uh, all through the common CRI API and the runtimes and the OCI communities uh, that deal with the specifications, do that work to make it possible to have a single interface to these new capabilities. Again, there will probably be, never be a clear path to commonality at the runtimes themselves. Effectively, at, the, at this moment, you have two main camps. You've got Docker dependent on Containerd and Run C, um, and you have Creo and Podman and Builda and C Run and some other tools uh, used in OpenShift and, and Red Hat customers uh, via RHEL and other uh, OS distros. There are different design ideologies between these two camps, 
And it really means it's unlikely that there will ever be an absolutely common API for runtimes outside of that layer above in the container runtime interface in Kubernetes. So we've covered a lot of ground trying to look into this aspect of APIs in the container landscape and ecosystem. Hopefully I've been able to demystify some of the different layers involved here from container runtimes to the OCI specs to the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, but I'd love to answer questions you might have. If you're watching this during QCon Plus, I think there'll be a live Q&A. And hopefully if you're in person in QCon London, uh, we'll have time there to chat about these issues and continue to see how our, our ecosystem progresses for APIs and tools and integrations across the container landscape. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for yet another awesome talk. Yeah, thanks, Wes. Um, so let's jump in right where uh, I think you answered it, but let's just take it uh, to uh, out verbally. There was a Nerd CTL. Uh, container D approach, does it use the same build API as the Docker file subject? Yeah, so very similar to how Docker has been moving to using BuildKit as the build engine when you install Docker. So that's available today using the Docker BuildX uh, extensions. Um, NerdCTL adopts the exact same uh, capability. It's using um, build kit under the under the covers uh, to handle building containers, which means it definitely supports a uh, Docker file directly. Um, so you said there towards the end, no clear path for commonality at the runtime layer. It's kind of CRI, Podman, Builda versus Docker, Container D. Um, where, where do you see that going? Do you, do you see that always being the case? Do you think there's going to be unification? What, what, what do, you, do you see that going? Yeah, I mean, I think because of the um, kind of a abstraction where a lot of people aren't building around a runtime directly today, you know, if you adopt OpenShift, you're going to use Creo. But do you, you know, was that a direct decision? Um, no, it's probably because you like OpenShift, the platform, and some of those platform capabilities. Um, Similarly, you know, Container D is is going to be used by a lot of managed services in the cloud. Already is, um, so you know, because of those layers of kind of platform um, abstraction, um, you know, it, again, personal feeling is there's not a ton of focus on. Oh, I have to make a big choice between Creo or do I use Podman for my development environment or or should I try out Nerd CTL? Um, you know, definitely in the developer tooling space, there's there's still potentially some churn there, and you can see uh, it's it's kind of I, I try and stay out of the fray, but you can watch on Twitter. You know, the there's the Podman adherence promoting you yeah. know Podman's new release and Rel, um, but I feel like that's not it's it's not necessarily the level of kind of container wars is when we saw Docker and Docker Swarm and, and Kubernetes. Um, I think it's more in the sense of the same um, kinds of things we see in the um, tooling space where, you know, you're going to make some choices. And the fact that I think people can now depend on interoperability because of OCI, it's not, it's not, there's no critical sense in which we need to have um, commonality here at the, at that base layer because I build with BuildKit, I run on OpenShift, and and it's fine. You know the image works. It's it, it didn't matter kind of the choice of build tool I, I used or you know my GitHub action spits out a an OCI image and puts it in the the GitHub container registry. Um, I can use that with Docker on Docker desktop. So um, I think the OCI has sort of calmed uh, any nervousness about that being a problem, that there's different tools and different kind of directions that that the runtimes are going in. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you have any questions, pop them in here. I'll uh, bring them into the conversation. Uh, one of the 
I, I, I meant to ask you when, when we talked before in QCon London about KO because I wasn't familiar with it. I'm familiar with cloud data build packs and kind of kind of the way that works. Is KO similar just from a Go perspective? It, it's just doesn't require a Docker file, creates like the OCI image from it. What, what does that actually look like? Yeah, I, the focus is really that simplification is I'm in the Go world. I, I don't really want to think about you know, base images and whether I'm choosing Alpine or Ubuntu or Debian, um, you know, I, I'm building Go binaries that are fully kind of isolated from the, they're going to be static. They don't need to link yeah. to other libraries. And so it, it's a streamlined tool when you're in that world. Um, and, and again, like I said, I think during the talk, they've, they've made some nice kind of connection points where, it's not just building, but it's like, oh, I can integrate this as a nice kind of one line KO build and push to Docker Hub. And so you get this nice kind of clean, very simple <clears throat> tool if you're, again, in that Go microservice world. Um, and it does, again, has has nice, because Go is easy to cross compile, you can say, hey, by the way, throw um, an AMD 64, an ARM, and a PowerPC 64. Um, image all together in a multi-arc uh, image named such and such. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's really focused on that Go microservice world. I think you answered a question similar to this in uh, at QCon London that was asked from crowd. Actually, I think Daniel Mango asked a question like it. But have you been surprised, or do you have an opinion on like how people are are using? Um, some might say misusing, but using OCI images to do different things um, in the uh, the ecosystem. Yeah, um, and that's a funny question coming from Daniel because he gave he gave a, a <laughs> hilarious talk at KubeCon. I, I probably I probably mis misrepresented it, so don't don't. Oh go. no 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 no! <laughs> no it's, it's actually a real question. It was just funny because. Um, one of his kind of mantras that he's known for is like taking, well, he and, and a few um, uh, co-conspirators have done hilarious things with OCI images. So at, yeah. at um, KubeCon LA last fall, they wrote a chat application that was using layers of OCI images to store the chat messages. Um, <laughs> so it was just showing, you know, in a, by taking something to, to the extreme showing, oh, by the way, an OCI image is just a bundle of content and, and I could use it for whatever I want. Um, so that was, you know. By, by the way, was, before he answers that, Dan, Daniel will be speaking later. Uh, I think I put the time before. I don't want to say a time because it'll be the wrong time. So, <laughs> but there, <laughs> there's, a, there's a time. It, two talks later, he'll be speaking. So, ahead, Yeah, yeah, time. yeah. And it's a great talk, too. So... Yeah, but but to bring it from the kind of hilarious extreme to to kind of the more um, uh, topic at hand, you know, I think the artifact work in the OCI, and if people haven't kind of read about that, there's search on artifact working group or OCI artifacts, and and you'll find a bunch of references. Um, the the fact is that like it makes sense that there are a set of things that an image is related to kind of the, if, if you think an object oriented, you know, what this object is related to that. So a signature is a um, component of an image or a S bomb, a software bill of materials is a component of an image. Um, and so it makes sense for us to start to find ways to standardize this idea of what, what refers to an image, uh, and so there's a there's a new part of the distribution spec being called the uh, worked on called the refers API, and so you can ask to re ask a registry like, hey, I'm pulling this image, what things refer to it, and the registry will hand back, well, here's a signature, or here's an S bomb, or here's how you can go find the source tarball for, you know, if it's open source software and, and it's under the GPL. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I'm definitely on board with uh, expanding the OCI, uh, in, not the image model, but the artifact model that goes alongside images to say, yeah, the registry has the capability to store other blobs of information uh, 
and they make sense because they are actually related to the image itself. And so, yeah, um, yeah there's there's good work going on there. And, and um, folks that worked with Daniel on that talk at KubeCon are very involved in that work. Um, and I think they're giving a follow-on <laughs> talk in Valencia next week. So if you're at KubeCon uh, EU next week, um, I'm sure it'll be fun and interesting, and they'll they'll uh, try and break the OCI registry model in some new interesting way. Uh, Chal- challenge, it, right? To grow and adapt. Um, so what what's next for the OCI? So you you mentioned like innovating up the stack. Um, I'm curious, like what's what's the threads look like? What's the conversation look like? What are, what are you thinking about the OCI? Yeah, so um, I think a major uh, piece of that is the work I was just talking about. Um, the, uh, the artifact and refers API are, are kind of the next piece that we're trying to standardize. Um, the container runtime spec, um, the image spec, as you expect, like these are things that people have built sort of whole systems on and they're not, they're no longer fast moving pieces. So you can think of like, you know, small tweaks, like making sure we we have in the standards all the right media types that reference, um, you know, new work like encrypted layers or new compression formats. So they, these are things that are not like, oh, wow, that's the most exciting thing ever, but they're little kind of incremental steps to make sure the specs stay up with where the industry is. Um, So, yeah, I'd say the artifacts and refers API are kind of the big exciting things because they relate to hot topics like secure supply chain and image signing. I was about to ask, yeah, specifically around secure supply chain, what what were some of the talks, but I I guess so. Yeah, so so some of the artifact work is like how, as people are going to build tools, so, you know, they're already... um, that's already happening. You have security vendors building tools. You have Docker uh, release their new beta of like their SBOM generator tool. The OCI's piece of that will be, okay, here's the standard way that you're going to put an SBOM in a registry. And here's how registries will hand that back to you when you ask for an image's SBOM. So uh, the OCI's piece will again be standardizing and making sure that whether you use tools from, uh, well, I won't name vendors, but, you know, the, the handful of security vendors and tools out there that they'll hopefully all use a, a standard way to associate that with an image. So uh, coming up, we're about one minute before the end. Um, what uh, what are you looking forward to next week in Valencia? Anything that you want to shout out or that people should take a look at? Yeah, um, well, you know, my, my focus stays pretty close to Containerd as a project. And this is the first KubeCon since the deprecation of Docker Shim. And so I think i um, excited to hopefully meet with people who are like trying to figure out what it means to move to Containerd underneath Kubernetes, uh, any issues they're, they're hitting. Uh, we're going to have like an office hours one day just for Containerd. Um, so hopefully meet some users and, and understand what they're bumping into. And Intuit has given a cool talk about their move to Container D. So I'm excited about that. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Well, if you head back to the schedule right after this, you'll see a Zoom link to join uh, Phil to be able to ask him your questions directly. Uh, after that, at um, in about 20 minutes, we'll have Matt Turner talking about modern API development. So basically talking about API gateways to sidecars, um, kind of that journey, that path, and some of the pros and cons. And then after that, as we mentioned, Daniel Mangum will be talking about using Kubernetes for on-cluster, off-cluster control plane for applications. Phil, as always, thank you for uh, doing yet another awesome talk. Appreciate it, sir. All right. Thanks, Wes.